I'm here to talk to you about Nomad 0.9 and the new features. So to talk about where we are today, I want to talk about, uh, or to talk about where we're going, I want to talk about where we are today and kind of the design principles that Nomad has always adhered to. Nomad has always been composable. And what I mean by that is you can use Vault with it to manage your secrets. You can use Terraform to provision the infrastructure. You can use Console to connect all the services, as well as Nomad itself can use Console to self-assemble your entire Nomad cluster with zero configuration. Not only that, but Nomad can operate as just one component in your overall platform. We see a lot of people building on top of Nomad so that humans may not even be interacting directly with it, but instead using a platform that they've built to uh, use Nomad just as the base scheduler beneath it. And so you see that you can hook your CDCI up to Nomad, you can hook an auto scaler up to a dashboard, you can also hook advanced batch processing platforms up to it. There's a lot of ways in which you can use Nomad as just a single component in your overall platform. And it's all pluggable, right? It's all, you can use whatever pieces you need. If you don't need vaults, don't use vaults. If you don't need console, don't use console. Nomad is trying to be as composable as possible and fit your workload. And part of that means running on whatever operating system you're on. So to, we've always supported Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. And we've always supported the wide range of runtime task drivers. QEMU for full virtualization, Docker for containerization, Rocket as an alternative containerization platform, as well as directly running Java jars and whatever binaries or executables you, you want to give to Nomad. So Nomad as of today, the 08 release, is composable. It's a one component of your platform. It's flexible. We'll try to run anything anywhere. But it's static. What we ship to you is all you can use. It's not easily extensible. And if you do want to add to Nomad, that requires you going to GitHub, forking the project, submitting a PR, opening issues, communicating with us directly, and then waiting for the next release of Nomad before that feature ever ships. So we're very excited that in Nomad 09, a major focus is making Nomad extensible. And to make Nomad extensible, we're starting by creating task drivers and device drivers, or task driver plugins and device plugins. So to talk about driver plugins a little bit first, all of our existing task drivers, QEMU, Docker, Rocket, Java, all of them are going to be plugins themselves. The plugins that the community creates, that you create, that you create internally, are going to have the same functionality and APIs available to them that our built-in plugins do. And so this should open up a lot of opportunities for all the variety of runtimes that exist today. Not just other containerization platforms like Podman and other operating systems containerizations like BSD Jails, but also uh, alternative platforms like .NET Core on Windows. We would love to see more people building out new workload support on Windows. I'm very excited to hear about Jet.com at this conference, and they have built out almost like a plugin before we provided the real plugin architecture uh, to support a new workload on Windows. And so it's very exciting. Thank you to them for, for creating this, and I hope we can help them port that to the new plugin architecture, because uh, it's exactly what that's designed for, as well as Singularity, which there's going to be a talk on later today. It's another containerization approach, and it's customized more for HPC workloads, which we're very excited to improve support for. So this afternoon, look for that Singularity talk as well, because I believe they are going to demo the first third-party implementation of a plugin. Along with plugins, we're going to be improving the way you can configure drivers. So at the top of the screen, you can see the old way that we allowed you to customize some of the behaviors of the built-in plugins. It was this very ugly map from strings to strings. Um, you had to refer to the documentation, and a typo could really mess things up. So in the plugin world, we're going to make plugin stands as first class. Plugins define their configuration schema. Nomad makes sure to verify and validate the configuration given to it. And so your plugin will only ever receive valid configurations that it defines. And you get a full type system, so you'll notice the Boolean true is an actual Boolean. 
It'll support numbers and more complex data types. No more having to stuff all kinds of information into these strings and parsing it back out. And so the nice thing for plugin authors is that Nomad handles all of the parsing for you. And then when your plugin actually receives the configuration, it can receive it as a well-formed object. Jobs in the plugin worlds will look exactly the same. They'll be fully backwards compatible. If you don't care about plugins, you can ignore everything I've said. Your jobs that run today will run tomorrow with zero changes. Now, behind the scenes, things have changed a little bit. We took this opportunity when implementing plugins to also implement uh, their configurations using the new HCL2 library that if you were around for the Terraform talks, they're using as well. Unfortunately, we're not enabling all of HCL2's features in all of the job file quite yet, but we're very excited to use plugins as an opportunity to start enabling more of the features today, and so you can expect in future releases that will be enabling a lot more extensible job file uh, creation. The plugin architecture communicates between the Nomad agent and plugins over gRPC, because plugins are actually run as external processes to Nomad. And the reason we chose that architecture is it's something we've done in other Nomad pro in other HashiCorp projects like Vault and Terraform, because it really allows you to isolate faults in each system. Nomad can crash, a plugin can crash, everything can recover just fine, and your tasks will continue to run unaffected by those faults. gRPC also gives us a lot of really nice features out of the box for plugins and plugin authors. Um, it handles bidirectional streaming, cancellation, log shipping, all kinds of great things out of the box, as well as being cross-platform. So while Nomad is and always will be written in Go, if you want to write plugins in another language, we would love to enable that in the future and having a gRPC API should make that a uh, much simpler proposition. So the other plugins that we're going to enable in Nomad 0.9 are device plugins. And this is an entirely new feature, un unlike drivers, which we've obviously always supported. We've always supported a basic set of devices. If you've used Nomad at all, you're aware that we support memory, compute, storage, and network resources. But we're very excited to announce that Nomad 0.9 will have NVIDIA GPU support, which should enable a wide number of workloads optimized for GPUs, uh, ML, AI, all to run across your GPU optimized cluster. And you'll use it just like any other resource in a job file definition. And so in this example, you can see it's using an NVIDIA GPU. It wants a node that has two GPUs. Each GPU should have at least two gigabytes of memory. And these attributes are definable by the plugin, by the device plugin. And they support a number of units and different ways of scheduling. So it can even take power consumption into account. It can take uh, bandwidth for any network devices that might get implemented into account. And it can even, you can even specify the model name of the specific device you want. If there's specific features of that device um, that you really require a very specific model for, we're very excited to see what people build with this in the future. Um, while we're shipping NVIDIA today, we're hoping to see a lot of community support for other devices in the future, especially as devices, even in the cloud, become more and more common, like FPGAs, HSMs, TensorFlow, TPUs. Um, there's a lot of exciting opportunities for Nomad in this device plug-in world. So Nomad 0.9 is extensible devices and drivers being the first plugins that we're offering. But really, what I'm the most excited about as a Nomad engineer is the plugin architecture is going to enable a lot of the features that many of you been, have been asking for for a long time, like storage volumes, networking plugins, logging plugins. And we'll be able to support those first class in Nomad, as opposed to many people using Docker-specific plugins and therefore having to use the Docker runtime. These sorts of things we want to support in Nomad Core through our plugin architecture, and we don't want to make you wait for us to release a new version of Nomad to use new capabilities of devices, drivers, storage volumes, and networking plugins. All of these things should be able to have a life of their own, maintained by a community, but obviously we'll still be maintaining all the drivers that we maintain today and all the devices that uh, we're, we're launching with the NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so I'm very excited about the, the future and all of the uh, advanced plugin implementations that people create, 
But that's not all that Nomad 0.9 has. And I would like to introduce Nomad's engineering manager, Preetha, to talk about some of the advanced scheduling features that Nomad 0.9 is bringing. All right, so I've been, uh, we've been working on making uh, quite a few enhancements to the Nomad scheduler, and I'm very excited to share all of that with you, uh, with you all today. Um, so just a quick overview of, um, of the Nomad scheduler itself. It's a very critical component of Nomad. It's what's responsible for uh, assigning tasks to, to client machines. Um, it, has, it uses a bin packing algorithm, which optimizes for resource utilization. And it respects constraints. So whatever constraints uh, as you, as the job operator, puts on the on the job, such as like these are the resources I want, or you know here's a machine that I want this thing to go to, it tries to respect all of that. So if you're not familiar with uh, with bin packing, bin packing is uh, basically an, uh, a placement algorithm that optimizes for. Uh, resource utilization by minimizing the number of machines that are being used. Um, a lot of people use Tetris as an example when they're explaining bin packing. That's fine, more power to them. I happen to think that computer science concepts are actually all around us, even in the daily world. So I like to use this pantry example. Just imagine a box in your pantry, and you're trying to fill it up with different um, items, you know, breakfast cereal boxes, uh, rice packets, whatever, whatever you want. There's a way you can arrange all that in that box such that you're able to fit everything in, right? That's basically been packing, except that instead of a pantry box, you've got a machine with you know, X amount of CPU, disk, and RAM, and you're trying to fit running tasks in it. Bin packing is great. Um, so one of the nice things about bin packing is that it just works. As an operator, you don't need to think about it. You just submit a job, and Nomad figures out where to place it. But there are some issues with bin packing, though. So the thing that I want to really get into is failure tolerance. So let's take a simple example here. Um, you've got a business critical web app. You, you want to run it on two different data centers, US East 1 and US West 1, and you want to run six instances of it. Now, Nomad's bin packing algorithm, so prior to 0.9, um, is purely looking at resource utilization. So it could end up placing it in a way that's shown here in this diagram, where five instances end up on US East 1, and one instance ends up on US West 1. There's a problem here. What happens if you have a data center level failure? Your entire US East 1 data, insta, data center is out. So that means you can't route any traffic to any of those uh, machines. And now you've got a single instance that, that's having to handle all your traffic. And it might just fail over or top lower because of a thundering herd of requests. What we'd ideally like to see, though, is a, uh, a distribution that looks something like this. So imagine if Nomad placed three instances on US East 1 and three on US West 1. Now, we've, with this, you've actually improved your failure tolerance, right? Because if US East 1 goes down, you still have 50% of instances left, and so you're fine. So the way we're solving this in 09 is with a new concept and a new stanza called spread. With spread, operators can specify target percentages across any node attribute or metadata. Going back to my same example of placing that business critical web uh, um, application, all you would need to do is make a simple change in your job spec file where you add a new spread stanza. By default, it's going to do an even spread. So we're not adding anything extra. If you see in this example, the only thing I'm specifying is what is the attribute that I want to spe spread on it's the data center. So that's going to lead to even spread. So if there are 10 instances, Nomad will place five in US East 1 and five in US West 1. You can also get more complicated with spread. So in this example, we, uh, we're actually specifying target percentages. So in, in this one, I'm saying I want 70% of my um, allocations or instances to end up in US East 1 and 30% in US West 1. You might be curious, why would I want to do this? Like, I should probably want even spread, right? Um, but the legitimate use case for something like this is a lot of times you don't have homogeneous capacity across multiple data centers. One of your data centers might be the primary. You just have more compute capacity there. And maybe your load balancer is also set up to route in a 70-30 way. 
So in that case, it doesn't make sense to additional to do an even spread. It makes more sense to have additional application instances in the data center that's receiving more of your traffic. So this is a use case for a spread where you specify target percentages. Another thing we could do uh, in Nomad 09 is have multiple spread attributes. So here, uh, in this example, I'm trying to spread eight instances across two different attributes, data center and rack. So imagine that I had two racks in each of my data centers. Nomad is going to sp spread four in each data center. And then within each data center, it's going to spread across the, the number of racks that I have. So it's two per rack. Again, with this, doing something like this, we've just increased the amount of failure tolerance you have. Because within a data center, if, say, rack one goes out for whatever reason, you still have capacity left in, um, in US East one. And the advantage there is like a rack level outage doesn't turn into a data center level outage because of spread. So to kind of summarize what spread, what we're hoping spread will provide to, um, to operators is to increase your failure tolerance across any domain. And it's really limited to your imagination in terms of how you model nodes in your data center. The richer metadata you can have, like let's say you start modeling power, power strip information, rack information, data center information, even like building information, the more you can put there, like the more um, uh, you can increase your failure tolerance. So that was spread. That's the one big thing that's coming in 0.9. Um, the next problem that I want to dig into is placement preference. So what do I mean by placement preference here? So in general, like I mentioned with bin packing, you don't have to do much. You just specify a job and resources, and Nomad will figure out where to place it. But sometimes that's not really ideal. Sometimes you do want to nudge the scheduler hey, maybe try this, like maybe put it here. You know, I have a certain preference. And there are many use cases for that. So one of them is uh, machine learning workloads. Machine learning algorithms run faster on GPUs, but there are also generations of GPUs. And you know, in your, in your environment, you might have multiple generations. And the newest generation is probably where it's going to be the fastest. Um, you could have old hardware lying around that's spinning disks. You don't necessarily want to throw it away. You want to put workloads that don't have too much I.O. Uh, they don't need fast I.O. They can run on spinning disks, whereas like things that actually need fast I.O. you should still put on SSDs. Encryption is another great example. So with encryption, there are uh, newer chipsets available where there's a hardware level instruction set for doing encryption. And there are encryption libraries that work really fast when it's run on that hardware. And so again, like for workloads where you know that this particular service is doing a lot of encryption, you might want to target that to um, hardware that's running the, uh, that fast chipset. So one way to do this in, uh, in Nomad 08 and prior is through constraints. Um, so if you're not familiar with constraints, like you can add a constraint stanza like this to your job, and you just say three things about it. You say what attribute, like what is the thing that you're constraining on? So in this example, it's node class. And then what's the operator? I'm looking for equality. And then what's the value, C4 large? So I'm saying that I want this job to only run on C4 large instances. So what happens when, the, uh, when this hits the scheduler? So when the scheduler sees a constraint attached to a job, it's going to treat it as a filtering mechanism. So on the right, I'm just showing some nodes in a cluster. I've got all sorts of nodes, but I only have two C4s. So when it's actually coming to the point where it needs to place those 15 instances, it's going to target, um, it's going to remove all the other nodes in the cluster and only try to place it on the two C4s. And that's probably fine if you have plenty of capacity in those C4s. But let's say that you don't. Like, you don't have capacity. Your, both of those C4s are full. Then um, you'll see an error like this. It'll say, I'm waiting for additional capacity to place the remainder. So that was fine for certain types of use cases. But in Nomad 09, we're introducing the notion of a softer constraint, and we're calling it affinity. So an affinity is similar to a constraint in the sense that it allows you to express a placement preference, but the interpretation is different. That's what's uh, important about an affinity. It's going to be a best effort rather than must, uh, must match. Going back to the same example, 
Um, let's say that the only thing I changed was I changed the word constraint to affinity. I still have everything the same. So now, um, the way this is going to be interpreted by the scheduler is that it's going to use it as a scoring mechanism. So all the nodes in my cluster will be scored according to uh, whatever affinities are uh, provided in the job. And as you can see in this example, the C4 nodes will still get the highest possible score. But some of the other nodes are also considered, or they're also scored. And then um, it does like a, a top K approach where it's going to try to fit as much as it can on the two C4s, because they are the ones with the maximum score. But once all the C4's capacity is filled, then it might it will place on like the couple of other nodes here, the blue and the red, with the 0.57 and 0.32. With affinities, um, we are also supporting multiple affinities, so you don't have to stop with one. Um, and affinities can have weights. So in this example, this job will have this job has two different affinities: one for the rack and one for node class. And the rack affinity has a higher weight. So the way this translates at, in terms of when it's making a placement decision is that a node that satisfies the rack affinity is going to get a higher score than a node that satisfies a node class affinity. But if a node satisfies both, then it's additive. So if, you, if we find a node that's both rack M1 and node class C4, it's going to have a higher score than one that only satisfies rack or only satisfies node class. We also support anti-affinities by allowing operators to specify negative weights. So in this example, we have an anti-affinity on T3 micro. That means that Nomad will uh, try to avoid placing on T3 micro instances as much as possible. But again, if there is no, nothing else, like you don't have anything else in your cluster, you only have T3 micros, it'll still try to place it there. We've augmented uh, the Nomad CLI. Um, so we have this Nomad Alex status dash verbose uh, CLI command that gives you more, uh, a little more deeper insight into what's going on with Nomad scoring. So there's a new table added called placement metrics in the end. Um, we did have this table in Nomad 08, but it didn't look nice like this. It was kind of very messy with like lines of output that was hard to interpret. So we've cleaned all that up, and uh, we've uh, provided output in this tabular format, where every row is a node ID, and then the columns are all the different factors that go into scoring. So in this example, we can see that the first two nodes got like an affinity score of 1.0, which is the maximum possible score, and then it got a different bin packing score, and then all of that combined together to produce a final score. So this is useful uh, for operators who are interested. You know, if you see a, a certain placement decision, it's nice to be able to dig deeper and like really understand why Nomad made this decision. So we've added this output for those who care to see uh, that level of detail. So in a nutshell, what affinities allow operators to express placement preferences in a, in a uh, best, uh, which Nomad will try to match in a best effort manner. The next thing that I want, the next big thing that I want to talk about is the problem of priority inversion. What do I mean by priority inversion? Priority inversion is a situation in, in a cluster where a higher priority job is not being able to be placed because all the capacity is taken up by running lower priority jobs. So let's walk through a real situation to see how that might happen. Um, so let's say that I started with this cluster. Uh, the green just means that I, these are nodes that have capacity. So I have plenty of capacity. I started by placing my business critical web app first. I set its priority to 90, which is pretty high. And um, I, I asked for five instances. So that takes up some capacity. Now, that business critical web app depends on a back-end payment service. And that also is pretty high priority. So we ask for five instances of that. And that takes up some capacity. Then our analytics team comes along. And they want to run some batch jobs, like analyzing some clickstream data or whatever. And that's low priority, because it's not in the critical path. Um, but they ask for 25 instances of it. And we have capacity, so Nomad goes ahead and places them. Then the marketing team comes along, and now they want uh, to run an email marketing campaign uh, to get people to click on ads. 
<laughs> what, uh, what, whatever use case you have. Um, and so that, again, it's a low priority uh, task because it's not in the critical path, uh, but we asked for 25 instances. We have capacity, so Nomad places that. Then the data science team comes along, and they're asking for 200 instances of like priority 10, some data science uh, model. If you think that 200 is kind of an unlikely count, um, it's actually not. So some of these large machine learning algorithms where you're splitting data into multiple machines, running like neural networks on them, 200 is, is fairly common. So at this point, the cluster is pretty close to being full. Now let's say that we get a surge of traffic and we want to scale our web app, which we only had five instances of from five to 10. Um, we're going to see in prior versions of Nomad, this would basically lead to a placement error in the sense that it would be a blocked placement. So an operator has to intervene. Somebody gets paged. You get up. You have to either turn off all those like marketing and data science jobs so that this job can run, or you have to scramble to add new capacity to your cluster so that you can scale up your web app. Preemption is a solution to this. Preemption, um, uh, the word just comes from operating systems too. Operating, our operating system also preempts tasks all the time. The basic concept of preemption is that in order to place a higher priority task, we're going to cause a lower priority task to stop running. There's one thing that we still need to be very careful of, which is cascades. Um, the easiest way to understand cascades is to think about a domino effect. So let's say that we're trying to place a priority 70 job. And to do that, we preempt a priority 65 job. Now the priority 65 job gets preempted and add, uh, gets added to the placement queue. Now to place the priority 65 job, we preempt a priority 60 job, and so on and so forth. I, I hope you see where I'm going with this, right? So the problem with, um, with that situation is that you're going to see a lot of churn and preemption and like lots of tasks being stopped in the cluster. In order to avoid that, our approach right now is to use a ba an implicit band of uh, delta of 10. So any jobs that are too close to each other in priority. So if you have a priority 70 job and a priority 65 job, we will not preempt the 65 job to place the se priority 70 job. It has to be at least a delta of 10 or more from the job being placed. Uh, preemption, like selecting things to preempt, is actually a very hard problem. It's a multidimensional selection problem. So I want to walk you through a specific example to give you some insight into how it's going to work in Nomad. Let's say that we're trying to place this priority 70 um, uh, job. Uh, you know, we, kn we know that it needs a megabyte, uh, sorry, a gigabyte of RAM, uh, two CPU cores, and, and one gigabyte of disk. And this node on the right is where we're trying to place it, but the node is pretty full. The colors on the node represent different priorities. Uh, the numbers in the, in the squares show you what priority they are. And then the reason there are different shapes is because this is pretty realistic. Like in a real, uh, in a real world cluster in Nomad, like you're not going to have homogenous tasks, right? Each one is going to use different amounts of CPU, RAM, and disk. So that's why the shapes are different. So the way the selection algorithm in, uh, in Nomad works is that it's an iterative approach. Um, it starts by first examining what's the available capacity on that node. So here, it realizes that there is no available capacity, and it looks at how much capacity it needs. It starts by examining the lowest priority allocations first. It starts from lowest to highest. So it finds the two priority 10 allocations. It examines how much RAM, CPU, and disk each of those things, how much resources each of those allocations use. Um, and then it uses a distance function to figure out which one is closest to the requirements that we're trying to match. So in this particular example, we find that we actually do need to preempt both the tens, and we add all that together. And at this point in the iterative algorithm, it's actually met its disk requirements. So we've, we've got one gigabyte of disk free. Um, and we have some amount of RAM and CPU, but that's still lesser than how much we need to, to make this placement successful. The next step is going to be, it's going to try to get the next highest set of priority allocations. So it examines the priority 15 allocation. And once it adds the resources used by the priority 15 allocation, we find that we've actually preempted enough such that our available capacity is greater than or equal to the needed capacity. At this point, Nomad will try to pl will place the priority 70 job, and it will um, stop the other, uh, the two priority 10 and the one priority 15 job. 
Now, um, we realized that uh, until now, the only, only operators were able to mark things as stopped. And with preemption, the scheduler is going to start making uh, these changes. And that can be very confusing to operators. So in order to provide visibility, we've made a few changes. The first change is that any allocation that's preempted by Nomad, so when Nomad try, the scheduler tries to stop it as opposed to the operator trying to stop it, it's going to have a new desired status field. So the desired status field is going to say evict. So that way, if you see something like evict, you know that a human didn't do it, the scheduler did it. Uh, we've also added two new fields to the allocation API, as well as the CLI. Uh, preempted Alex and preempted by Alec ID. Um, so preempted Alex is the uh, any higher priority allocation that caused lower priority allocations to get evicted will have this field populated with the IDs of the allocations that it preempted. And then the other field is in the opposite direction. So if a lower priority allocation got preempted by a higher priority allocation, it's preempted by Alec ID field will point there. So we're also going to make changes in the UI and the CLI so you can see this and click around and kind of explore and see what happened when something got preempted. Another thing we've done is we've added it to Nomad Plan. So Nomad Plan is the dry run. Um, so in, especially in CI, CD environments, you probably do a plan before you apply. Um, if the plan is going to cause preemptions, there will be a section that shows what those preemptions are. In terms of how this is getting rolled out, Nomad OSS uh, is going to ship in 09 with preemption capabilities for system jobs. And Nomad Enterprise will have preemption for batch and service jobs in the next release, Nomad 091. In a nutshell, preemption keeps your business app critical apps running. We talked about a lot of stuff, so I want to summarize everything that's coming in Nomad 09. We've implemented uh, task driver plugins, which is going to make the runtime driver system in Nomad extensible. We've implemented device plugins, and we've built on top of that to support GPUs. And the scheduler got a bunch of improvements, spread, affinities, and preemption. And I think I have two minutes, so I'm going to try to show you a demo. <laughs> Let's try to pray to the demo goddesses. So I've got a, um, a dev cluster running with a, with a priority 20 job. And it's actually taken up all the resources. And I'm going to try to run a, um, another system job. So this demo will be of system job preemption. Control-C. This is something new in Nomad uh, 09 as well. We can, uh, you can submit jobs through the UI. Um, it's, a, it's hidden behind an ACL, but I've disabled the ACL for this demo. So I'm copy-pasting this job definition. And first, I want to show you what happens if the priority is the same. So this is still a priority 20 job. So it cannot cause preemptions, because the other job is also priority 20. So I run plan. I see this expected output. Resources are exhaust exhausted. I don't have room to place this job. Now I'm going to change the priority to 50. Run plan again, and we see this new section here, required preemptions, and it links to like, it's Nomad, the scheduler has determined that it can preempt this other thing that I have running in order to place this higher priority allocation. So I can control click, go there, explore, okay, this is something else. Uh, this, is the, this is the other allocation that's running that's going to get preempted. So let's say I'm fine with that. I can say run. And at this point, if I go back to jobs, you'll see that this sysredis job, the, prior, the higher priority job, is running. And this one is in pending state. So it's been added back to the queue. And once you give it additional capacity, it'll be able to place that. So that's preemption. 